to study and became a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. So I have <coughs> tremendous amount of joy in me <coughs> that 40 years ago God did a miracle in my life that has start, that started my spiritual odyssey that has led me to where I am today. Yeah. And my sermon title reads Jesus and the Unpardonable Sin. Now some of you will wonder how can I have the sermon title Jesus and the Unpardonable Sin when Jesus himself specifically stated that the unpardonable sin is against the Holy Spirit. So my title for my sermon should have really read the Holy Spirit and the unpardonable sin. But as we are going to go through this study, I hope and pray that you will see why I titled my sermon Jesus and the unpardonable sin. When, in your thinking, when was the first unpardonable sin committed? I always like to always go back at the beginning. Whatever I am studying or sharing, I always want to go to the beginning, wherever that beginning may be, whether it is uh, a principle that's laid out in the scriptures at any stage in the history of the world. Whenever the principle is laid out, I always like to start where the principle is laid out and then go throughout the scriptures and try and harmonize what is involved. So the first time we know, biblically, the unpardonable sin was committed was in heaven. Lucifer and one-third of the angels committed the unpardonable sin. And our scripture reading for this morning starts with Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 12. You might again wonder why this particular scripture reading when we are talking in terms of the unpardonable sin. And the reason is, I like to go right at the beginning and then follow it through. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come for the accuser of our brethren. He accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death very unique statement that is made there. They did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to you, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. And I want to emphasize that last portion. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. And before that, it says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. So the woe that is to the inhabitants of the earth will involve what is the unpardonable <coughs> sin. So when we think in terms of this war breaking out in heaven, a lot of us might think in militaristic terms that it was a 
military type of a war. And if you do, then I beg to disagree with you, because it was not a militaristic type of war. The Bible is very clear that this war, to understand what this war means, or what the word means, we have to go and look at it in the Greek. And in the Greek, this word is polemos. We get the English word, polemic. And what is polemic? Polemic is a strong <laughs> written or spoken attack against someone else's opinions, belief, practices, etc. The art or practice of using language to defend or harshly criticize something or someone else. So this is the nature of the war that broke out in heaven. It was not a militaristic war. It was and always has been a spiritual war. Even the Battle of Armageddon, some of us might have conceived in our minds that the Battle of Armageddon will be a militaristic war. It is not. It is a spiritual war. If it was a militaristic war, now think of this, this is extremely important what I'm going to state now. If it was a militaristic war, all Jesus had to do was think in those terms, and what would have happened? Every one of them would have been annihilated. How do we know this? Proverbs 23, 7 tells us, for as he thinks in his mind, so he is. This is a principle. Jesus also makes this statement in Matthew 5, 28. Whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if there's something already in the heart, it's going to be demonstrated one way or the other. So here, if this was a war with that kind of a condition that we might perceive or conceive, that all Jesus had to do was think in those terms. And every one of them, Satan and one third of his angels would have been annihilated. So this war in heaven, <clears throat> from us who are Seventh-day Adventists, know very clearly that this war was between who? Michael and the dragon. So this war in heaven involved Jesus Christ and Lucifer. That's where this started. So what was this war about? What was it all about? over. What was the reason for this war? There was only one thing that governed the universe before this war commenced. Only one thing. And that was what? God's law of agape love, which is the very essence of his being. So whatever law was going to govern the universe had to be what was innately in God. So innately in God was the law of agape love. And that law governed the universe. As Lucifer started questioning some of these thoughts that developed in his mind, that how can the universe be governed purely by agape love? That if he created any kind of a problem, if he introduced evil in the universe, then how can agape love possibly address this evil? You need something better than agape love. You need something that will address evil. Prior to this, there was no evil in the universe. This is how his mind developed, and if, if 
those of us one you can confirm it from the scriptures plus the extra biblical uh, inspiration that we have so he introduced a system and that system was based on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil we can take it from there the principle is laid out in the garden the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and we can take it back to heaven and know that this is exactly what started so he introduced this system of good and evil that was totally and completely against god's rule of law of agape love with this in mind those of you that know how i have been led to understand the scriptures you will realize that there is no possible way for me to ever go back to the Aussie grant that was Aussie 40 years ago no possible way it is impossible for me to ever go and be the Aussie that was 40 years ago because in my spiritual walk in this 40 years Jesus Christ initially it wasn't the case i usually stated this way that i came into adventism through the back door and i'll explain what that means the back door means that i became an adventist intellectually it got proven to me intellectually that there was no way out and believe me when i tell you this those in those days that knew me knew that i had a passion to read i was a passionate person that i read i just read whatever it was i would read so i had this passion to read and in the process of my crisis certain individuals that knew that there's only one hope was he grant and that hope will be that if he ever starts reading some of the things that was very carefully laid around the house by different people that this will help him well what really caused me to start reading what was around the house because my two sons were both baptized as catholics and what ended up happening this is in vancouver they started going to the adventist church in vancouver vancouver central and that caused me unimaginable pain and anguish so i started investigating and i realized that this occultic or cultic movement just started no more than over a hundred and some years and i thought how can this offshoot or or whatever it was claim the claim that they were making and i started looking into this and as i pursued this no question or doubt in my mind i read what was available and the reason was because i treasured and i valued the life of my two sons to such an extent that i had to investigate why they were being taken to this adventist church that is going to be nothing else but a hell on earth for them as a catholic i believe that the catholic church was the only church that had the truth and no other church had that truth so that led me to start investigating adventism and as i read it took me a year and 3 months 15 months i can know it exactly october 31st 1976 i was baptized as an adventist christian 
And I came through the back door. I'm emphasizing this. I came through the back door. Took me from 76 to the mid 80s, close to about 1985, when I'm confronted with all kinds of issues and dialogue over this whole doctrine of righteousness by faith. And listening to different theologians, reading books, just in no uncertain terms, really investigating this, I came to the realization that there was something not right. So I prayed, and by the mid-80s, certain very definitive and clear understanding started gelling in my mind with no input, believe me when I state this, no input from any other source. Approximately, I don't know what length of time, but I would say approximately a couple of years. Just my Bible and myself in California, studying the scriptures and searching why am I a Seventh-day Adventist and why am I a Christian and for that matter, why am I a follower of Jesus Christ? What happened in 85 settled it for me by the time in, in within that time frame. It settled it for me and I knew that this is the path that God is leading me. So I'm going to read from Hebrews chapter 5. If you can turn to Hebrews chapter 5 verses 12 to 14 first. Hebrews chapter 5 verses 12 to 14. We're going to be using a lot of the scriptures so I hope you'll be able to turn to the passages we'll be look, looking at. Hebrews chapter 5 verses 12 to 14. And then we're going to go into Hebrews chapter 6 and onwards. So Hebrews chapter 5 verses 12 to 14. For though by this time you are to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word, word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses excised to discern both good and evil. Then in chapter 6, from verse 1, Therefore, now the therefore must apply to what I have just read, Therefore, leaving the discussions of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Of the doctrine of baptism, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Now this portion from verse 4, keeping in mind that this study we are doing has also direct application on me. But I'm not trying to promote myself Believe me when I'm telling you this, under no circumstances am I trying to promote myself, but I'm trying to share with you why I believe that when I have titled my sermon, Jesus and the Unpardonable Sin, you will see why I have done that. That through the scriptures, we, we, we are going to read and see what Jesus himself personally has told us what the unpardonable sin is. Even though he specifically stated the unpardonable sin is the sin against the Holy Spirit. He stated, you can say whatever you want to say. 
against Jesus, the Son of Man, you will be forgiven. But if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, you will never be forgiven. So how can the sermon be titled the way it is? Unless we study the scriptures the way the scriptures should be studied. And that is what? It must rise and fall on the person of Jesus Christ. If it doesn't rise and fall on the person of Jesus Christ, this very Bible from Genesis to Revelation will become a curse in our lives. That's why Jesus has become so, so important for me. And this is why I can never go back to what I believed prior to what I believed the Holy Spirit and Jesus revealed to me. So verse 4, and please note, I have made it very clear that this is nothing of trying to promote myself. For it is impossible for those who have once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. If and we can look at this also in chapter 10. If in any way I would have to go back and believe the way I believed previously, with what I believe God has blessed me with now, and what I understand from the scriptures, the revelation that Jesus Christ has given to me, of who this God of the universe is and what he's all about. For me ever to let go of what I know and go back to the Aussie that predated 1975 and even up to the mid 80s. I would fall in this category. I've got more verses to confirm this, but I believe we leave it where it is. The next incident I want to bring to our attention is when Adam and Eve sinned. Did they commit the unpardonable sin? So I'm, I'm stating this here. And now I'm going to go back again to Lucifer and one-third of the angels. Did Adam and Eve, when they disobeyed God, blatantly went against what God had told them, not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because the day you eat of it you will surely die. They did not obey and they sinned. Did they commit the unpardonable sin? Now how did Lucifer and one third of those angels commit the unpardonable sin? The reason they committed the unpardonable sin because they were given and were exposed to the complete and total revelation of who God is. The total revelation was with them. If their total revelation wasn't with them, they would not have committed the unpardonable sin. They tasted the heavenly gift. They were right there in the throne room of God. Lucifer was right there in the throne room of God. So they had tasted the heavenly gift. They were completely and totally exposed to God's love. Adam and Eve were not given that kind of a understanding and exposure. They were told certain things 
They had a fellowship with Jesus on a one-to-one -one basis, but they had not known God the way Lucifer and one third of the angels did. On those basis, even though they sinned and went against Jesus, they were not in that category. Now I want us to turn, keeping in mind that Jesus is the most important person in the universe. So you might turn around and ask the question that if Jesus is the most important person in the universe, then what about the Father and the Holy Spirit? If you look throughout the scriptures, the Father, the Holy Spirit and Jesus, no question, they are completely and totally united in every sense of the word. But there is something that the Father and the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to prove this from the scriptures, gave Jesus that preeminent position. The Father and the Holy Spirit gave Jesus that preeminent position. And I want us to go through the scriptures now and look at some verses. First, let's go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, and we'll read from verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, Jesus Christ, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. This is referring all to Jesus Christ. Verse 3. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. That, and we're going to look at other verses to confirm this, what John is stating here, that Jesus Christ, all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made in the entire universe. We're going to see this. Every act of creation in the entire universe was done by no other being. The Holy Spirit wasn't involved in that. The Father wasn't involved in that. Jesus was the sole being that did the entire work of creation in the universe. When we think in Genesis 1 and 2, it starts off with the word God, Elohim. And we all understand what that means. In chapter 2, from verse 7 and onwards, the Lord God comes in. Jesus was the person who did the work of creation even there. Let's look at uh, verse 4. In him, John 1 verse 4, in him was life and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. In the Greek, if you go and look at that word again, it can mean understanding it or it can also mean that the darkness did not overcome it or extinguish it. So nothing could extinguish or overcome this light, Jesus Christ. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not the light but was sent to bear witness of the light. That light was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. So John is very clear here that Jesus Christ was the only true light that, coming into, that came into the world. So prior to Jesus Christ, the true light was not given to the world. And again, we're going to confirm this. It'll take us a bit of time to do this. But this time, we'll keep going until we finalize this. So, he 
is the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But to as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. And keep in mind, name in the Bible always refers to character. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. Which means to say there was nothing lacking in the person of Jesus Christ when he came with that full revelation of grace and truth. But I want to emphasize this word truth. And my brother uh, Richard did a tremendous job when he had on the board here written truth, <coughs> all truth, and nothing but the truth. Straight away the light bulb went into my mind that the only person that has made that claim for himself was the person of Jesus Christ. He didn't say, I've come to give you truth. He clearly stated that he was the truth. So he is the only one that can give us the truth about God. Nobody else can. That's why the Bible is very clear that Satan did not have one thing against Jesus. Satan could not take Jesus out into any form of sin. Jesus Christ was the only infallible, inerrant word of God. Yeah. That's why it clearly states he was full of grace and truth. Everything that Jesus uttered, everything that Jesus taught, everything that Jesus revealed was the true revelation of God. And the cross was the proof of what God is like. There he revealed the ultimate truth of what God is like. John bore witness of him and, and cried out saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness, verse 16, And of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And we must not let that verse pass very lightly. We should analyze that, dissect it, and study it in the light of Jesus Christ's revelation. Then, John, very systematically now, he goes into verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. No one has seen God at any time. Is that a true statement? From what we know from the scriptures, others had also seen God. It's very clear and I don't want to go and pull out all those verses to confirm it. Others had seen God. So what is John stating here? No one has seen God at any time. He is stating that no one has been able to give that revelation of God except Jesus Christ. That's why he's saying no one has seen God in that sense, that he is the ultimate and the true revelation of the Father. 
in Acts, let's turn to Acts chapter 14. Just to make sure that we, we, we grasp the significance. And I might be belaboring this, but for me it is so important that we understand why Jesus Christ is non-negotiable in his revelation of the Father. We cannot, there's no compromise in that area and I cannot compromise in that area because that is what has made all the difference in my life. If it wasn't for that, if it wasn't for that understanding, I would not be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian right now and I wouldn't be here. And I'm stating this. The reason I'm stating this is because it is the truth in my personal life. So in Acts chapter 14, verses 15 to 17, and saying, this is uh, uh, at, at Lystra, what's going on in Lystra, and saying, men, why are you doing these things? Paul is stating this. We also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them. So it's very clear he's identified Jesus as the creator. Who when? Who? Who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways? Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witnesses in death. He did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, fulfilling our heart with food and gladness. And Jesus again personally covers this in the Sermon on the Mount. That God makes his sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Nevertheless, it's the same thing here. He did not leave himself without witnesses that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons. Acts chapter 17. I'm not going to cover the whole passage. I just want us to look at uh, from verse 23. This is his, uh, you know, in Athens. And he, he's walking through and then he sees this one uh, statue to the unknown God. For I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar to this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. God who had made the world and everything in it, verse 2, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Who is he talking of? Jesus Christ. Because he is the one that is responsible for all of creation. Now is he worshipped with men's hands and though as though he needed only uh, anything since he gives to all life, breath and all things. This God, he gives life, breath and all things. So if he gives this, then who is the one that takes it away? And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined the pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in, for in him we live and move and have our beings, as also some of your own prophets have said, for we are also his offspring. So Paul is quoting here from the Greek uh, poet. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by the art of man's devising. Verse 30, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. And who is this? The person of Jesus Christ. 
to make sure that we grasp the significance of Jesus' uh, preeminence as the Creator. I want to look at a few other verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. From verse 10, 10 and 11. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise, Paul is clearly stating this, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. And another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. Extremely important what Paul is stating here. For next verse, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So if in any other foundation we are trying to understand the scriptures, we have a problem. The only foundation we have is Jesus Christ. And He is the cornerstone. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Verses 14 to 17. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, we are the aroma of death leading to death and to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? Verse 16, Jesus Christ is what? To one, we are the aroma of death, leading to death. So if Jesus Christ is not what he, claimed, he personally has claimed for himself and what the entire scriptures have pointed to, the person of Jesus Christ, because Jesus himself had said this in very uncertain terms, that the whole of scripture is focused on him. So if we don't listen to him and listen to anyone else, it will lead to death. And if we listen to him, it will lead to life. For we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as, but as of, of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. So nothing we should be speaking sharing, studying from the entire scriptures, but the person of Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, Colossians chapter 1, verses 12, Colossians chapter 1, I mean, sorry, Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or power. All things were created through him and for him. Verse 17. And he is before all things. And in him, in the person of Jesus Christ, all things consist. In the person of Jesus Christ, all 
things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. In everything, Jesus Christ must have the preeminence. In Hebrews chapter 1, applying directly to us, Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 to 3, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by the Son. Very clear. He spoke to us previously by the prophets. But in these last days, He is speaking to us through the Son. To make sure why the unpardonable sin is completely and totally locked in with the person of Jesus Christ and with everything we have so far looked at, I want us to look at a few more passages to settle this. I want us to turn to Matthew chapter 17 to make sure that this thing is settled. Matthew chapter 17. In Matthew chapter 17 verses 1 to 5. Keeping in mind that this is on the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses is there, Elijah is there, Jesus is there and God the Father is there. This Mount of Transfiguration is a miniature depiction of the second coming. And I'm not going to go into all the details. My emphasis in this passage, because to go to the whole detail is another study all on its own. My emphasis in here, and I'm going to read it from verse 1 to verse 5. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. This six days is very important. It applies to 6,000 years of world history, and that we are at this time frame of the sixth day, 6,000 years, the transfiguration happens, the second coming is, is right there. And he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the, as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. God the Father cuts in. As Peter is speaking, God the Father cuts in and tells him, while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. God the Father has spoken and God the Father is telling every one of us. If God the Father told us something, would we listen? He's telling us. Hear Him. Why hear? In, in, in the previous occasions, God the Father spoke, the baptism, He spoke and He said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am what? Well Please, did he say any more than that? No, he did not. Twice, he did not. This third time, there's Moses and Elijah there. And this third time, God the Father speaks and says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him, listen to him. Don't ever get sidetracked with anything else. Jesus Christ, is the only person that is going to give you a true revelation of me. Jesus Christ is the only one that is going to tell the truth to you about me. I want us to look at Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Moses and Elijah were there. I'm, I'm going to leave Elijah out of this one. Just I want to look at, at, at Moses. Moses in Deuteronomy 18, then it is also covered in the book of Acts. And I read what Moses clearly has stated from verse 15. 
of Deuteronomy 18. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. From your midst and your brethren, him you shall hear. Moses didn't say, you listen to me or listen to anyone else. Moses is very clear that when this prophet comes and he's going to come from within the midst of your people, when he comes, hear him according to all you desire of the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let us see this great fire lest I die. They were in abject fear of this incident. What happened? They were in such fear that what Moses is saying, that God is going to send you a prophet. Hear him. Why? Because he's going to teach you that what you have just observed and the fear that is in you, he is going to explain to you why you should not have that kind of a fear. That's what is, the context is, is right on there. And the Lord said to me, what they have spoken is good. So what God said, what they have spoken is good. I am going to send them a prophet that they can listen to him. And he's the one that will take away from them any of this fear-oriented thought that they have. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I have commanded him. And Jesus has confirmed this over and over again in the New Testament. That everything he's saying, everything he's revealing, it's coming directly from the Father. And that's what this verse is again saying. God is telling him, He shall speak to them all I have commanded him. Verse 19, And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. God the Father has again put Jesus Christ where God the Father wanted him to be. Hear him on the Mount of Transfiguration. Here, we are clearly told, he will speak in my name. I, my name. And if you don't listen, I will require it of him. This is the unpardonable sin. And we're going to confirm this with Jesus' own words. Verse 20, but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And I don't want to go into all the details to try and explain this. The prophet that is going to give the true revelation of God will not die. Jesus died, but he was resurrected and the proof is he had the power within him to raise himself. Why? Because Satan had nothing in him. At the end time, the group of people that will not experience death that will be translated, they will speak in no other God but the revelation that Jesus Christ has given a God. That's why they're going to be translated. They will live that life and reveal, and that's what Elijah represented there. That's why Elijah made the